your monthly dose of astronomy news and views. This is Awesome Astronomy. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Awesome Astronomy for May 2013 where we've got a few changes, a few surprises, but the same astronomy awesomeness. More of that in a minute as this month we'll be bringing you a guide to May skies, what you can see and when, astronomy news from Mars and the Planck mission in particular, a new feature explaining confusing concepts in astronomy and we're going to be starting the guide to the Big Bang this month, an interview with a man who tells us if an asteroid's going to hit us and as always the part where you can all join in, questions and answers. My name's Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me for the last time as a co-presenter is Tom. Hello, and goodbye. So you're leaving us. Where'd the love go, Tom? Uh, what love? What love? We're a malicious race of Martians. We've tried to destroy everything. It's only a matter of time before we destroy our interpersonal relationships. <laughs> the self-destructive slope. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am leaving. Um, well, maybe not forever, but I am uh, I am going to be going and pursuing a few other projects, and I understand that someone else will be taking up the mantle in my absence. Yeah, and stepping into your shoes to fill the void, we've got the very capable Paul Hill, who's another excellent astronomy communicator. Hello. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you on board, Paul. I know we're in safe and capable hands, and looking forward to some of the new features that we're going to be introducing. And Tom, you've known Paul for quite some time, too. I have, yeah. We go back a, a way. Paul has visited Mars many times. Uh, so what's on the horizon for you now then, Tom? Well, as you know, uh, I'm going to obviously be freeing up a little bit of time. I'm thinking of taking a trip down to Earth and picking up a few projects there. And uh, among those will be another uh, project along the same sort of lines of awesome astronomy. But um, I can't say too much about that just yet. Oh, not a competitor. Well, uh, not really. Maybe... Uh, Maybe a complementary alternative. Mm -hmm. I like to think so. Okay. And there's a couple of other things too. I am in the process of writing a book, and that is coming ever closer to release. It may even see a release this year. Have we got a name for that yet? Oh, yes. The name is Astrophilosophy. You're going to have to give us a hint about what that's about. Well, you can get a pretty good hint by going to the website, astrophilosophy.co.uk. Uh, you can also tweet me at tom kerz if you are interested and i'll be happy to tell you more about it and the last of the projects that i'm working on is of course a tuition company which is in the process of being set up as i like to travel around in the great city of london occasionally and teach people how to set up their telescopes and this is something that over the last year or so has become ever more formalized and of course there will be room for excellent astronomy communicators to join in that project in the future so uh paul uh, if you uh, if you ever become as competent as I was on the show, there might be five pounds an hour for you. <laughs> oh, oh, how can you turn down? I can't like turn that down. <laughs> well, it was a great year on Awesome Astronomy that we had, Tom, and it's a real shame to lose you. So I hope you're going to pop back every now and again. Will you do that? I will pop back every now and again, and I will keep listening to the program, of course, and I may even send you difficult questions as anonymous people to try and make your job harder. And we're going to start off this month with the skies. Tom, what have you been looking at during March and April? Oh, uh, it, it, it's Paul. <laughs> um, pan stars. It's been the uh, been big on my uh, radar last last month. Pan stars when the weather's allowed. That's been yeah. good. Yeah, the comet that uh, that we hoped was going to burn brightly, but didn't didn't get as bright as we'd hoped. But we still got some good views of it very early on. I think it was just a, about a day or two days after perihelion, which I think was the twelfth yeah. of March. We got a view of it we from got, central London. We got some very good views early on, and then the weather came in, and we had a we had a big wait. Um, yeah, but it was still there a few days later, and it was it was good. Yeah, and then it rose through um, Andromeda. It passed very close to M thirty one, the Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. made its way through Cassiopeia, so getting. Higher up in the sky, into into darker skies later on, but it yeah. faded. At the yeah, same time. it's fading. It's 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 getting hard to find. Um, it's, it's getting close to being a telescope object now. Um, it's getting out of binoculars. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was disappointing to what was predicted, but it was still nice to see. I mean, I think it's the first decent comet we've had in the northern hemisphere for many years. Yeah, many years, but it's still good for astrophotographers. People are still being able to yeah. take good images of it, especially now that it's got into those darker skies. And, uh, of course, we wait to see what happens with Comet Eisen later in the year. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed on that one. Yeah, and then there's uh, oh, there's been Saturn, um, which 
it's coming close to opposition. It's opposition at the end of April, and it's not high this year. It's in Libra at the moment. It's still a great view. It's about 20, 25 degrees yeah. when it reaches its highest this yeah, month, isn't which it? Yeah, is, which is lower than last year. It's going to be a while before we get in a nice high sky again. Yeah, but we still do get that wonderful view of the rings. You can see the Cassini division, the, the darkest mm. division within the rings. Um, you can make out some of the cloud details, even though it is still quite low on the horizon. Of course, there's at least Titan, one of the moons that you'll be able to yeah. see, and you could probably pick up a few more, even with a modest telescope. But um, with Jupiter now dropping in the sky, it's it's a shame that we have to say for this year goodbye to the planet Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. Well, until until well into to the autumn if you're an early riser, and then uh, it's going to be winter. I mean, there's no Jupiter opposition this year. That's right. Yeah, there's no one until January. There's not until January. No, because opposition was in December. So. Yeah. I mean, although we're saying goodbye to Jupiter, Jupiter is going to provide us one little last finale towards the end of the month with the conjunction with Venus and with good eyes or good sky, Mercury as well. And towards the end of the month, sort of from about the 24th, we should see this little triangle formation of planets um, low on the horizon towards the north northwest. With three planets slowly, what looks like passing each other. So Venus is going to be really bright. Mm. Jupiter will be. Jupiter will be bright, but nowhere near as bright as Venus. Um, and then Mercury will be the, 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 the poorer be... companion. Yeah, I mean it, it's going to be mag minus point nine. I think is what. So it's... still so pretty bright. Still, but it, it's you know it's a small object. And how high up in the sky do we think that triangle is going to be? Um, it's not high. So this is this is going to be a tough. Tough thing to see. Yeah. Um, but if you see it, it's going to be stunning. But now that we're moving into the spring months, what you really find is all those galaxies that start rising. So yeah. we've got the galaxies that are in Leo at the moment. Leo's really nice and high, mm, almost reaching mm, the zenith. Um, the Leo triplet. Fantastic. It's, it's just a must, must see. Yeah, being able to get three galaxies in the same eyepiece, it's the same stunning, field of view. Stunning sight. Um, yeah, that's one of the the great sights in the sky. And then trailing just behind that, we've got Virgo, and in between there, we've got the the realm of galaxies, which yes. with a higher power eyepiece and telescope set up, or with an imaging set up, you can really pick out dozens, if not hundreds, of mm. galaxies all in the same area, and the magnificent cascade of galaxies called Macarian's Chain, which is just a wonderful a wonderful sight to image. But it's also something that you can pick up in a in a, a largest telescope. Yeah, if you're if you're lucky enough to have a large scope and a, and a good dark sky, that is that is a magnificent thing to see. Um, uh, there is something really special about seeing a, an area of sky that's just completely full of galaxies. And then finally, we've got the Eta Aquarius that'll be in our skies early in May. That's going to be on the sixth of May that it reaches its peak, and that'll be very early in the morning when it does get to its darkest. But the radiant, the point where the meteors will seem to appear from. It's quite low down on the horizon. It's actually in the constellation of Aquarius, which at the time of the peak will be at the eastern horizon. But as with all meteor showers, you're better off looking a good 10 or 15 degrees higher. So if you look around about the Pegasus region, you should be able to get a good view of this. But at its peak, it will have a zenithal hourly rate of 55 meteors an hour. Now, you probably won't see that many because... To see 55 meteors, it would have to have a radiant at the zenith and under perfect conditions. And because this is so low down on the horizon, a lot of them will be washed out by the thick atmosphere at the horizon. But um, it's certainly worth looking out for. And you do get some some very nice meteors during this annual meteor shower. And of course, this is debris left over from Halley's Comet. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the comet, um, Halley's Comet. And it, it um, gives us two showers a year, um, the Orionids in the autumn. Uh, which is a, a good shower as well, but much better placed um, for the UK. This is awesome astronomy. Well, turning to the news, I'll start with an update on the Chelyabinsk meteor. From meteorite fragments that were found near Chelyabinsk, where the meteor streaked through the Russian skies on the morning of the 15th of February, we know that it was indeed a chondrite meteor, probably about 17 metres wide and around 10% rock, which allowed it to fragment and partially burn up in the atmosphere in a way that an iron meteor probably wouldn't. An iron meteor would have probably hit the ground, causing much more damage. But analysis of the meteorites that were found around the area also revealed some shock melting veins. And these veins, or long fractures, in the rock showed that the meteor had at some point collided with another asteroid with quite some force. And it was likely to be this impact that kicked it out of its stable orbit in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and then on a trajectory toward the Earth. And the airburst that you'll remember set off car alarms and caused damage to so many buildings was actually detected by the infrasound instruments that are designed to detect atomic bomb detonations. And these suggested 
that the airburst let loose up to 40 times the energy released in the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So it's really fortunate that it happened so high up in the atmosphere. And that only happened because it was mostly rock rather than metal. And of course, that happened on the uh, the same day, the, the morning of 2012 DA14, uh, which for some people was a great event. I think if you were in the north of England, in Scotland, you you got some great views. We in the south, we were uh, we were disappointed. Yeah, probably due to the cloud more than anything else, wasn't it? But um, yeah. but of course, you were on the BBC that day, telling telling the BBC news all about it. I was, I was. The great irony. I spent lunchtime talking to the BBC about it and didn't see the thing at all. <laughs> And moving on to Mars, the Curiosity rover has been making waves yet again since the last episode because the latest big news from Mars came in a NASA conference on the 12th of March where we heard about the latest results from the Curiosity's experimentation payload, specifically the sample analysis at Mars and the chemistry and mineralogy instruments because they've analysed powdered rock and clay from the first ever drill sample taken on another world. How cool is that? It, it, it's a seriously, seriously cool vessel. A vessel? It's not a vessel, it's a vehicle. vehicle. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a vessel, it's a vehicle, it's a ship. <laughs> and drilling down allows you to get past the surface debris on rocks to a kind of geological timeline and see the conditions that existed in the past. Now, we know that Mars isn't favourable to life now because it has a very tenuous atmosphere and no flowing water. Although that doesn't necessarily preclude the possibility of very hardy microbes from living on Mars now. But the Venerable Rover Opportunity, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and now the Curiosity Rover have shown that water did flow on Mars, and analysis of the clays which would have formed in the presence of water and held on to that water's mineral content for Curiosity to examine shows the water was not only flowing, but not too salty or too acidic either. In fact, it had a pretty good pH balance. And the rock sample shows that the elements needed for familiar life, so that's hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon and phosphorus, existed in the Martian environment billions of years ago. But crucially, so did hydrogen sulfide, which is used by some microbes on Earth as an energy source. So all the ingredients are there, and the NASA scientists could actually tell that the water that existed on Mars would have been safe to drink. Just how amazing is it that you can infer something like that? I think it just shows just what a wonderful tool science is for being able to yeah. tease out these details. Yeah, isn't it? it it's I mean, and it's just saying we've we've got to keep going back to Mars and we've got to keep taking new stuff there. And then NASA's decided they're gonna go again with with Curiosity's brother. Curiosity too, yeah. So lots to come from Mars. Lots to come. Well that sounds like mission accomplished. So what do you think's next for Curiosity? Well, there's been a bit of a hiatus throughout April because the sun's directly between Mars and the Earth, which can disrupt radio transmissions, especially now because of the sun being so near to its active peak. So commands to and from Curiosity have been curtailed as a precaution, and the rover has been left to accumulate around 40 gigabits of data for transmitting back to Earth in the next few days. Then, when the rover does return to normal service early in May, the next steps will be to examine that oxygen and carbon that they found in even more detail before they journey on to the layered slopes of Mount Sharp, where we expect to get an even better look at the geological history of, well, this Martian environment that it finds itself in. So sticking with Mars, and this is really cool, the Red Planet's going to get a close encounter with a comet next year, and the upshot is that the prolific comet hunter Robert McNaught discovered yet another comet in January this year called C2013A1 Siding Spring. And NASA's calculations of its trajectory suggest that it'll pass within 68,000 miles of the surface of Mars on the 19th of October 2014. And that's less than a third of the way from the Earth to the Moon. Now, comets differ from asteroids for many reasons, but most importantly in this case because they contain loads of volatiles like water, methane and carbon dioxide ice that boil away as they get closer to the Sun. And they produce that fuzzy haze or coma that's so familiar to anyone that's been watching Comet Panstars recently. Now when Comet Panstars was still beyond the orbit of Mars, its coma was already 74,000 miles wide, even though the comet's nucleus is only about a kilometre wide. So if the trajectory doesn't change much over the next year, Mars should get quite a debris shower. But the outgassing that causes the comet's coma can act like thrusters, and if they significantly shift its trajectory, it doesn't have to move very much to be put on a collision course with Mars which would create an explosion that would make it visible to Earth-based telescopes if it hits the Earth-facing side of the red planet. Now, clearly, this outgassing could move it further away from Mars, so there's likely to be a big debris shower on Mars next year, with the slim possibility of a gigantic impact. About 1 in 120,000 chance, so not likely, but it's possible. And that'll be recorded by a fleet of Martian rovers and satellites. 
I mean, we don't actually know if Mars has glowing meteor showers because the atmosphere is so thin, they might not actually burn up with the same brilliance that they do in Earth's atmosphere, but we'll know for certain next October. But there's an opportunity for observations here too. The comet should be brighter than zero magnitude to any cameras on Mars if it flies past, and Earth-based observers should also be able to see with a scope as it's expected to reach magnitude 8 from Earth. So mark that down in your diaries. 19th of October 2014, Mars will be visible from Earth. Yeah, Mars will be visible from Earth. And finally, we're going to move out of the solar system for some real fundamental cosmology discoveries from the European Space Agency, Ralph. Yeah, that's right, because ESA's Planck spacecraft has released its map of the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, or CMB. And this map has a far greater resolution than the maps that were produced by COBE in 1992 and the WMAP survey over the last decade. But what all of these have been searching for is structure within this very first light from when the universe became transparent some 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And resolution is everything in this hunt. Now, if you've got access to the internet as you're listening to this, just Google Planck CMB, that's P-L-A-N-C-K CMB, Charlie Mike Bravo, and take a look at the red, green and blue mottled oval image that comes up because this is the all-important new map. So... In this map, we see the mottled pattern of the CMB that shows us where the clumps of dark and normal matter existed that went on to seed the galaxies that exist today and which we now sit in. And this is where matter condensed into these clumps. Now, the CMB is also our greatest evidence that the Big Bang Theory is correct, and Tom's going to explain the Big Bang to us in a moment. It's cool, but yeah, yeah, I will. So... The Planck team released their new map last month, and it has a few surprises as well as giving us more detail about the universe we live in. Now, firstly, the expansion rate of the universe has been revised in light of the Planck data. So based on W map, we had an accepted rate at which the fabric of the universe is constantly expanding at 21.3 kilometers per second per million light years. Whereas now we've got a figure of 20.9 kilometers per second per million light years. Not a big difference, but it has a direct bearing on the second revelation. And that is that the age of the universe is older than we thought. If the universe is expanding, but expanding at a slightly slower rate than we thought, then it would take longer to rewind a video of the history of the universe if we had one to watch. So, the age of the universe, according to the Planck map, is 13.82 billion years old, give or take 37 million years. And this is interesting because this is nearer to the upper end of the uncertainty range in the W map data which informed our previous best estimate. But combining the data from all the missions, we get an average age of the universe of 13.798 billion years old. And finally, if the universe is older than thought, and therefore not expanding so fast, there can't be as much dark energy out there, dark energy being the name given to the force that causes the universe to expand. And it turns out that this is reflected in the Planck data. We now have revised figures for how much matter, dark matter, and dark energy there is in the universe. So we now have figures of 0.4% more normal matter, the stuff we see, that's you, me, planets, galaxies, and toner cartridges, 4.1% more dark matter, matter that's got a gravitational influence but we can't see it, and 4.5% less dark energy. So the universe is now thought to contain 4.9% normal matter, 26.8% dark matter, and 68.3% dark energy. But the nice surprise was that an asymmetry in the earlier maps that could have been artifacts or false readings by the recording instrument are once again revealed in the Planck map, but with greater clarity this time. Now, predictions of inflation say that the microwave map should be uniform, with the mottling being uniformly spread out in each direction, but there's a clear asymmetry from one side of the map to the other, and a large definitive cold region that shouldn't exist. And George F. Stathio, a Planck scientist from the University of Cambridge, says that this defines a preferred direction in space, which is an extremely strange result. This rules out some models of inflation, but doesn't undermine the idea itself. It does, however, raise tantalising hints that there may yet be new physics to be discovered in Planck's data. And how cool would that be? Yeah, it's going to be really cool. I mean, that's we always want new riddles. And new mysteries to new, solve. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and that's what these satellites are doing. They're answering questions and then posing more. This is Awesome Astronomy. Okay, so that's the news, and now Tom's going to demystify some of the fundamental concepts in astronomy and cosmology each month. And this month, we're going to be starting with a simple explanation of the Big Bang. <sighs> it's, 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 it's cool. It's cool. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right, well, Big Bang. Um, 
It's not big, and it wasn't a bang. Um, when I say big, of course, I mean in the sense of where it all started. It expands into a universe bigger than we can conceive, but at the start it was smaller than an atom. Of course, big doesn't even begin to convey the amount of material contained within that point. The basis of everything you see around you, the universe above your head, an awful lot more that you can't, came out of that sub-atom-sized spot. There was no bang, as there was no sound, and if you built yourself a time machine, you couldn't sit and watch the event, as winding back the clock would see you inside the point. But that is where the universe is at the start, all of it. There is nowhere to park your DeLorean outside to view it. It's pretty mind-bending, isn't it? <laughs> and that's the difficulty of thinking about the Big Bang. It's so far outside our normal experience that the human mind can't even construct an accurate image. So we have the soundbite, Big Bang, and that's down to one of the theory's arch critics, Fred Hoyle. He didn't like Big Bang, and he gave it what is in fact a, a pejorative name. Fred was a proponent of the rival universe called Steady State, a universe that did battle with Big Bang for most of the second half of the 20th century. Steady State was the descendant of a much older view of the universe, one that Newton would subscribe to, a universe of constant, unchanging aspects in infinity. Newton, of course, described gravity mathematically for the first time, and he was also the first to stumble on the consequence of gravity for the universe. If everything tugged on everything else, then the universe should surely, inevitably and with increasing speed, collapse in on itself. For Newton, the answer led him to conclude that the lack of observable collapse was down to the work of a universal constant, working to prevent the end of creation. In his case, God. A little over two centuries later, someone else was grappling with a universal constant, all the time watched over by a portrait of Newton. Einstein gave us the modern view of gravity, a universe of space-time full of curves and relative movement, but Einstein's own maths suggested the universe was moving, that depending on what figures you popped in, we had a universe expanding either slowly, ever more quickly, or indeed a universe that appeared to describe Newton's nightmare. Albert was horrified. The universe was permanent and unchanging, and in frustration he inserted a constant to keep the universe neatly balanced and ordered. It didn't last. Others had begun to see what Einstein's work was saying. In Belgium, Georges Lemaitre had begun to piece together a universe that began in what he called the primordial atom. The problem was the universe appeared unchanging. What Newton had put down to God and Einstein had fudged seemed to hold sway for, from observation of the sky. Then a man spent time with a hundred-inch hooker, just outside Los Angeles. It was the biggest scope in the world, and with it Edwin Hubble showed that, with a couple of key exceptions, galaxies were flying away from us, and each other. The more distant they were, the faster they were moving. The universe was expanding. This, of course, leads to an obvious issue. Reverse the clock, then all the galaxies, everything inside the universe flies together. At some point in the distant past, it all must have been in the same place. The Big Bang appears to explain this phenomenon, but then so did Steady State. Hoyle would maintain that, yes, the universe is expanding, but as it did, more matter was created in the increasing spaces, giving the impression of unchanging aspect, explaining the movement of the galaxies, and showing where the matter came from. Well, almost. The universe was trapped in a never-ending Groundhog Day, as far as Hoyle was concerned. Big Bang, as Hoyle christened the rival to his theory, needed evidence, and it is that evidence that has been the story of cosmology over the last 50 years. So what is the best evidence for the Big Bang? Well, the early universe would have been a strange place, one where light could not travel any distance, as it constantly bumped into everything else that was part of the hot cosmic soup of particles. Electrons hadn't joined with protons and neutrons to make the atoms that we see today, due to the intense heat in the early universe, a universe that was composed almost exclusively of hydrogen and helium. But the universe was expanding and it cooled. The atoms combined and light exploded out across the universe. This moment, said to have occurred 380,000 years after the start of the Big Bang, was predicted to still be with us. This light, stretched by the universe's expansion, should by now, so theory went, be very cold, very long wavelength light, somewhere in the microwave band. It was found by accident in 1965, and this is what those pizza-looking pictures are coming out of those odd-sounding satellites, Covey, WMAP and Planck. A picture of the first light of the universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's passing through you now, filling the space around you. You can listen to it by detuning your radio or TV. 1% of that hiss is the beginning of a universe full of light. CMB didn't fit Steady State, but it did fit Big Bang. There was a lot wrong with Steady State, despite a certain elegance, but CMB was a big nail in its coffin. There are issues with Big Bang still. If you wind back the clock, there just hasn't been enough time for the universe we observe, for the size we measure and the large-scale structures we can see to have formed. Then there is a problem of the universe having a similar temperature everywhere we look, despite distant parts being well beyond touching distance at the speed of light, an issue known as the horizon problem. More recently we have found the universe appears to be defying Newton utterly and not collapsing, or even slowing, but speeding up in its expansion. The theories of inflation and dark energy, like a Newtonian god or an Einstein constant, step in and save the day here. But that's another story.
And is that going to be a story for another day? Maybe if you stop calling me Tom. Maybe. Well, thanks for that, Tom. Some say Paul. And now, for the interview this month, I spoke with Dr. Tim Spar about finding, cataloging, and working out the orbits of comets, asteroids, and moons. Incidentally, Tim's the guy that'll be the first to know if and when any comets or asteroids are on a path to collide with Earth. So I couldn't let him go without asking him about that too, could I? This is Awesome Astronomy. This month I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Timothy Spar, who's the director of the Minor Planet Center at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Well, Tim, thanks for taking the time to speak with us on Awesome Astronomy today. Thanks for having me. This will be a lot of fun. Well, could I first start by asking you all about the Minor Planet Center? Where is it? How is it funded? And what are its main functions? Okay, the uh, Minor Planet Center is run at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a staff of, you know, there's sort of six of us, and we've got people working on various projects here and there. We're funded entirely by NASA for the operation. You know, this is quite a change from the past where we were funded through subscriptions and donation, et cetera. So we're really pleased to be under a grant structure, which makes our life a lot easier. And how does that fit in with the current sequester cuts at the moment? Well, as I I answered uh, this question previously, I hope I'm doing it properly, but uh, we have a grant that uh, we're in year two of a five-year grant, and so I have seen no impact whatsoever. They have not cut my budget because it's existing funding. So that should be continuing uh, as, as far as things go at the moment. Yes, and I will assume it is until someone tells me otherwise. Well, fingers crossed there then. And uh, and there's probably nothing more topical at the moment than uh, near-Earth asteroids and, and comets and the, the work that you do at the Minor Planet Center. After we had a, an asteroid fly past Earth in February and then the same day we had a meteor searing through the skies over the Russian Urals. And now, of course, we've got Panstars putting a lovely display as we speak. So, so can you tell us uh, more about what it is that the, the Minor Planet Center actually does? Absolutely. So the Minor Planet Center is the world's data collection and distribution center for observations of asteroids and comets. Uh, In practice, what happens is there are observatories all over the world that discover asteroids or track asteroids. They send their positional measurements to us and we compute the orbits. We identify what they've sent us. Uh, If they find something new, we announce that they've made a new discovery. And then our sole mission is making that data 100% available to the entire world. And so if there's an object on a close pass to the Earth, we will know about it. We publicize that. Um, if there's something that needs a close check that might be you know, something that would impact the Earth in the future or may impact in the future, we publicize the orbit and the data. And then other groups such as uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena or the University of Pisa uh, will download that data and compute the orbit and check for you know the specifics of a possible impact. Yeah, we, we probably take it all for granted that any comet or asteroid discovery already has its orbit defined, but somebody actually has to do that. And is that you guys? Do you actually work out their orbits? Yes. So the, the principal role of us is to uh, absorb the information from the public, the positional data, and we compute the orbits. That's the first thing that we do. And so our orbits, um, we, we publicize them every day on our website. But yes, that is our principal function is identification and then orbit computation. And how do you compute those orbits? Well, it's a quite a complicated mathematical procedure that in practice requires calculus in six dimensions. <laughs> So that's 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 what's being done every day now. Absolutely, I don't do that any longer. The computer does it. <laughs> you must be glad of that. Uh, right, and uh, in some sense, I'm sort of the boss and the figurehead. The people that do the nitty gritty of that work with me. I don't say they work for me. They, you know, it's a team thing going on at the Minor Planet Center, and I've got a couple of people who are just absolute experts in that uh, the physics and calculus of this problem. And you mentioned earlier about near Earth asteroids and the asteroid 2012 DA14 that that, that buzzed past Earth uh, a couple of months ago. Can you put our mind at rest about the possibility of it hitting the Earth any time in the future? Yes, uh, 2012 DA14 will not impact the Earth in the future. And one way we know this is that when things pass very close to the Earth, the viewing angle is wonderful and we get really high precision measurements Mm -hmm. and the object cross the sky relatively quickly, which enables us to do very high precision orbit determination. So this is a, it's a safe object. 
that will not impact the Earth. And, and how far in advance can we uh, can we determine that? Well, in this case, within three days of discovery, we knew 2012 DA14 would not hit the Earth a year later. Yeah. And so that was really neat from our perspective because people were quite worried about it, and we weren't at all because we had done the calculation. <laughs> that, that is a quick calculation, though. Oh, yes. Well, um, some of it has to do with just the high-precision nature of the work that is being done. When I started in this field, you know, two decades ago, that would have been a harder calculation to do. But we have better computers. We have much better measurements. And we literally have an army of people that observe these things now. It's really fantastic. And looking um, at 2012 DA14 as a specific case here, how far into the future can we uh, be certain that, um, that it's not on an orbital path with Earth? I believe now that we have 2012 DA14 out to 100 years from the present. Yeah. So that's quite comforting when you uh, you can put one in the not going to hit a 100 year <laughs> bin. And now that we're getting more sophisticated at detecting these, uh, well, ever smaller objects, really, what's the current thinking on how much stuff is out there floating around and how much do we think poses a danger to us? Well, we know there are a lot of objects. Uh, the WISE mission, uh, with the principal investigator, Amy Meinzer, for the NEO-WISE portion of the mission, uh, made an estimate for the number of near-Earth objects down to about 100 meters, maybe 140 meters. And that's, you know, coming in the, you know, multiple tens of thousands range. Mm -hmm. And so that's clearly a lot of stuff. And, and at the very small sizes, we know there are millions of things that could impact the Earth. Now, the plus side is the Earth hits things all the time. There are meteors and meteor showers. And that's generally not a big deal and nothing to worry about. In terms of the 50 meter objects, we would really like to find all of those down to 50 meters in diameter. And that's frankly just millions of objects. And I understand that the PanStars team are hoping to be able to get down to objects that size. Are there other surveys that are, that are doing that kind of work to objects down at that level? Yes, we have uh, several active surveys right now. The uh, University of Arizona has um, the Catalina Sky Survey team. They run several telescopes around the world, including two in the mountains outside of Tucson, Arizona. And those are capable of finding objects down to just a couple of meters in diameter. Just a couple of meters, really? Yes. And in fact, the Catalina Sky Survey or Mount Lemmon Survey found an object that impacted the Earth in 2008. The discoverer was Richard Kowalski, a friend of mine. And he reported an object to us and we predicted successfully predicted the impact uh, 19 hours later. It's so reassuring to know that there are people actually trying to solve this problem, and I'm so delighted and so surprised to hear you say that down to two metres, because I, th I was thinking that anything under around 50 metres was going to be uh, problematic. Well, the, you're correct that it's problematic anyway, because we don't find all of them very quickly, uh -huh. and it will take quite a long time with the existing facilities. So we need the next generation of facilities to find the really small stuff. And that necessitates going outside of the atmosphere of the earth and probably using an infrared telescope. Right. And now the, the instant you try to put a telescope in space, your price tag is, you know, in the neighborhood of half a billion dollars. So we need things like Chelyabinsk to happen to, uh, to get the political will to do something like that. Uh, perhaps there's certainly a, a lot of interest in this, over the last decade, though, NASA has uh, done several reports sort of stating how much it costs to do this work and how it should be done. So it's not a surprise to everyone. And there has been certainly in the U.S. Congress some people that have been interested in, in increasing the funding and actually launching a spacecraft to do this work. Well, uh, moving on to something that's in the sky right now that people can see, Comet Panstars. When did you get the data on this object and how we are able to calculate its orbit so precisely? Well, this object was found quite a long time ago, 2011, and at the discovery, it was clear that it was extremely distant from the Earth, you know, out in the range of the orbit of Saturn or Jupiter. And originally, the first predictions were that it might become very bright. Mm -hmm. And comets are always difficult to forecast their brightness in the future. And one of the PanStars people called me and said, hey, do you think we should you know, announced this in a press release that there's a big bright comet coming. And I said, whoa, wait a second, <laughs> because the, especially the history of the Minor Planet Center and the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, we are very careful with comet <laughs> brightness predictions. Everybody loves a comet that fizzles out. Right. And that happens so often it's frustrating. So my job almost always is to temper expectations 
And, you know, philosophically, I'd rather be pleasantly surprised than disappointed. Yeah. And uh, and what what do we think is going to happen with Panstars now? We've got it in the sky and it's just moving uh, through naked eye visibility. And we know that it's going to get much fainter as the the months go on. What what can we expect um, telescopically for people to be able to see over the next few months with Panstars? In the next couple of weeks, it'll probably provide absolutely beautiful views through amateur class telescopes, you know, small um, 10 centimeter telescopes. Take your pick, right? And so anybody that can go out and get a look at it in a small telescope should do it. And the photographic opportunities for the wide field cameras, it, it will be stunning and beautiful. But it's not going to be something like, say, Comet Hale Bop, which the public could see from London or New York City. It will never be like that. Yeah. And probably the most frequently asked question about this comet why is it called C2011 L4 Panstars? Okay, wow, this is great. I get to answer this in, in the perfect forum. Uh, we try to come up with a designation system that will label each object uniquely. And so the C slash 2011 means it was a comet discovered in 2011, and the L and the 4 tell us in which order that was found and in which month. And so you can go on our website and look up exactly how to read those designations. And as you guys are given those designations, is that right? Uh, Yeah, the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, in conjunction with the Minor Planet Center, handles all of the comet data. And uh, so, yeah, we're the we're the keepers of the orbit catalog and the designations here. I like that title. Now, you you personally have got both asteroids and comets named after you for the discoveries that you've made. Uh, we heard from the Panstars team last month all about the technologies that they use to make comet and near-Earth object detections increasingly more efficient. Can I ask you what methods and equipment you use to find the comets and asteroids that bear your name? Uh, yes, and this is going to send me back to, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, I started using film, and I think maybe my dissertation project was one of the last successful photographic surveys for asteroids and comets. So this is before digital imaging. Yes. And so in one sense, you know, they talk about character building events in your career. This was surely it. (laughs) Um, I had to move the telescope manually. I had to change the films in a light, tight box. I had to develop the films and I had to scan them by eye and measure them by hand. So you were looking at overlaid images and seeing where the movement was rather than having software to do that. Yeah, and I did that with a stereo microscope. Oh, wow. And so then uh, when I completed my graduate work, I went back to the same facility at the University of Arizona. That's now the Catalina Sky Survey, by the Uh way. So it's the world's most productive survey. Um, And no, I didn't do all of the work there. I want to be clear about that. But I helped found it, and I wrote software once they switched to digital. Pretty awful software, but it got the job done to detect the asteroids and to measure their positions. Oh, wow. So you straddled both technologies there then, going from the analog to the digital. Yeah. And then, which is what's really great is there's always somebody who writes really good software. And so I passed off the terrible things I'd written to somebody who knew what they were doing. His name was John Brownlee, and he wrote beautiful pieces of software, and some of which Catalina is still using today. And you've also detected moons too. Uh, Carillowy, uh, a magnitude 21 moon of Jupiter, I believe is one of them. Can, what, what can you tell me about your Jovian moon? Uh, Okay, I have a Jovian satellite and a Saturnian satellite, and they were both sort of fluky kind of things. The Saturnian satellite was found as part of a remote observing program. A friend of mine said, can you take a set of images for me? Um, And I took them as part of my my program, and I gave them to him, and he came back and said, oh, you just discovered a satellite of Saturn for me, Um, which was neat. The the Saturn moon uh, Albiorix, was that the one, did you find that before the Jovian moon Carillowy? No, I think it was after, and these are these are quite distant in my past, and I had so little to do with them that I've forgotten a lot of it. All I did was take the images for one, and the other one, the Jovian satellite, I found an object in the MPC database that had an orbit that was odd, and I found additional observations for it, and I could not make the orbit work, and I went across the hall to Gareth Williams, who's my orbit specialist, and at the time, I was not the director. And I said, hey, what's up with this? Is it around Jupiter or something? Can you do the orbit? And of course, he told me it was a satellite, a new satellite of Jupiter. Well, it sounds very modest to me. If I'd discovered uh, moons of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, whether it was unwittingly or not, I'd be telling everybody about it. Well, hey, I, I do enjoy that. And I, I my comets and asteroids are, are my babies as far as that goes. <laughs> uh, so finally, then, looking further ahead to the next real treat that we're expecting in November, what can you tell us about Comet Eyes on and what are the latest predictions for that? And I know earlier you said that you, you don't like to make predictions for comets, but um, can I force you on this one? 
All right. Well, I, I'm happy to discuss it, and I give the, the pretty much the same line on it. Anybody who's saying this is going to be magnitude minus 13 brighter than the full moon on a dark sky is incorrect, and that is hype that we don't need. Right. It will likely be an extremely bright object, but when it is that bright, it will be literally right next to the sun in the sky. Yeah. And so you're not going to see something as bright as the full moon careening around. It's just not going to happen. And it'll be a point source anyway, right? Correct. Now, there is a good chance this is a bright object for the public, but I always caution people that comet predictions, brightness predictions, are extremely difficult. And in fact, they're basically impossible mm -hmm. for something that's this far out. We think it will be quite bright, and it's going to pass relatively near the Earth. Not, no danger whatsoever, but close enough that objects that are that close tend to be quite bright. And it'd be very favorable observing circumstances for the Northern Hemisphere. So I have my fingers crossed that this will be a beautiful comet, uh, but I don't think it's going to be... Uh, like, for example, we had Comet McNaught in 2007. That was one of the most beautiful comets of all time, and I don't think very many people saw that. That's the one where the tail really fanned out as it moved across the sky, wasn't it? Yes, and so from the Southern Hemisphere... Um, that thing was so beautiful, it had people in tears mm. down there. I don't think Ison's going to be that bright. But we still think that it's going to be brighter than Venus, is that right? I would say that's a safe bet, but again, that'll be when it is literally right next to the sun in the sky, and I doubt anybody will see it. Right, so we're just going to have to wait and see how it, how it pans out. Yeah. Well, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you here on Awesome Astronomy, and thanks very much for keeping our solar system in order. You're very welcome. It's been an honor to be here. This Okay, so now it's questions and answers, and I think you're going to help me out with this one as well, Tom. Yeah. Cool. The first question this month asks, what causes the bars in barred spiral galaxies? This is one of the things that puzzles me most. And that question comes from Miles Hendricks, who, with a name that has a contraction of Miles Davis and Jimi Hendrix, has to take the prize for the coolest name, surely. <laughs> Over to you. Barred spirals. Right. They're beautiful, aren't they? Um, barred spirals. I mean, the Milky Way is an example, possibly. Mm -hmm. There's been a debate about that. There's been some debates about that recently. Um, the majority of spirals that we've observed are barred spirals. Um, something like 70%. And recent observations of the past, and that's, that's a really cool thing about astronomy. You get to look back in time. Having your own time machine. As you've got your own time machine. It's great. But yeah, looking back in the past, it, it looks like bars are more recent. That actually, they were rarer in the past. There's something like 20% of galaxies in the past had bars. Now it's up to 70%. So for want of a better term, it seems to be a sort of sign of galactic maturity. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the bars? Two parts of this answer. What we think they do and how we think they're formed. So I'm going to deal with form first. Current theory. It's called density wave theory. Um, this was created back in the 60s um, by a couple of guys in America, a guy called Lynn, a guy called Shu. Um, and they, they, they had this sort of the galactic problem of why don't spirals just collapse? These hmm. things are spinning. Why don't the arms just sort of fall in? And they call this the wind-up problem. So if you imagine a, a spiral like a hurricane or something like that, you know, imagine the arms spinning. You think well, they, they would surely just eventually collapse in mm -hmm. on themselves. The solution is a bit counterintuitive. The arms don't move. I'll sort of say that again, the arms don't move. So those arms you're seeing in spiral galaxies don't actually move. So forget images of circular saws and hurricanes and they're, they're our everyday experience of the sort of spinning spirals. Mm. That's not what, how it works. Though Those arms are like a sort of traffic jam. So if you think of the stars that are moving around the galaxies independently in orbit around the galaxy, they, they come to an area that's denser and this is this wave come emanates from the centre of the galaxy. Uh, it's like a traffic jam, so in the same way that uh, your car, you, you drive a car, you hit the traffic jam and you, you crawl your way through the traffic jam, and it's a, a denser part of the traffic, and then you pop out the other side and you drive off. But the traffic jam is still behind you, it's still there, the, the cars move, but the traffic jam actually stays where it is. Keeping it static. Keeping it static. So, yeah, the, the arms, those, those, those spiral structures are actually kind of like permanent features in a way. It's, they're, they're denser regions for this wave, and the stars move through them. That's, that's the first thing to say. So if you think of like the sun, uh, the sun's in the arm, the arm it's in now. It moved into it a long time ago, um, and this will move, it'll move out in the future, uh, and then eventually move into another arm. So the wave itself is responsible for how these bars form in more mature spiral galaxies. Um, and it's a sort of build-up of mass, like a, a sort of denser traffic jam near the centre. And then we think in galactic time spans, they, they, they appear 
the mass builds up and then they collapse, they evaporate essentially, and then they, they return. So mm-hmm. these these bars are transient. Not transient, they're not permanent. So what do they do? What do these bars do? Well, the theory says that they, they channel material towards the galactic centre as part of a process called orbital resonance. Probably a subject for discussion itself. Um, but it's essentially where orbiting bodies pass each other at regular intervals and so push or pull each other into sort of changing their orbits. Um, so this density wave is, is causing these denser bars and then the material is being channeled down through orbital resonance. Um, and this is supported by the fact that the bars seem to be areas where there are lots of stellar nurseries, so there's lots of stellar creation going on. And they bars tend to be seen in active galaxies of active centres, so this material is funneling down into the centre of these galaxies. It's an area of research. It's, you know, it's still, these are just theories. It's another area it's of active in... research, and it's there's still a lot more yeah. research to be done there to find out what it is, but we've got current theories and models that fit. Exactly. Um, uh, this, and this way, this, the density wave theory does seem to stand up, and it's it's been around since the 60s, and it's been used to explain well, the, the rings of Saturn and things oh, like that. Absolutely. So it's well evidenced, mm. but lots of research. Yeah. And the second question comes from Quainer in South Africa, who wants to know about Mars's atmosphere, whether it contains oxygen, and if not, what it does contain. And, well, yes, there is oxygen in Mars's atmosphere, Quainer, but only 0.1% of Mars's atmosphere is oxygen, and that's compared to the 21% that exists in Earth's atmosphere. Although Mars's atmosphere is only 1% as dense as the Earth, so you still need a pressure suit to survive on the surface of Mars, and there wouldn't be nearly enough oxygen to breathe. And... The answer to the second part of your question, Quainer, the other main gases that make up Mars's atmosphere are 1.5% argon, 2% nitrogen, and an overwhelming 96% carbon dioxide. But these concentrations do fluctuate a little according to the seasons and local topography. Now, some of this carbon dioxide, for instance, forms ice layers on the poles during winter and turns to gas in the atmosphere during the summer months when it warms up. But most of the planet's oxygen reserves the thought to be held in metal oxides and pernitrates within the rocks and the soil. The Phoenix Lander and recently the Curiosity rover have both revealed oxygen locked away within soil and rock samples on Mars. Well, we might know more about that with, with Curiosity's mission, and certainly with the missions in the next few years. And our final question comes from Darren Knight in Cambridgeshire via the Facebook group, who asks, why doesn't the moon rotate, and who would win in a thumb wrestle, you or Tom? Well, um, Tom's not here, but... We can have a thumb rest if you like. Well, let's do that when we close out. And how about you tackle the question okay. of the moon's rotation? Um, it does. Next question. Any more? No. Oh, you, well, you want a better That's answer? Can, can we have a bit more? You want a bit more? Why not? Okay. Right, the moon does rotate. A lunar day is just over 27 Earth days, which the more observant of you will notice is the same as a lunar month. In other words, the moon rotates in the same period of time that it orbits the Earth. Uh, the fact that it keeps the same face pointing at Earth demonstrates this, and you can you can replicate this if you're so inclined by walking in a circle around a tree or a lamppost. Try walking around, but always try to turn face the tree or the lamppost. You'll find that you're constantly having to turn or rotate to face it. We call this synchronous rotation. Um, it's worked out by Charles Darwin's son, George Darwin. So why does it happen? It, it, it is a more complicated thing to explain. It's a process known as tidal locking. And you may be aware that the tides on Earth are caused by the pull of the moon and the sun's gravity on the oceans, uh, raising their height. So, and this, this occurs to the land as well, which is raised in height when the moon is overhead. So this creates a bulge in a body like Earth that over time acts like a break, uh, the bulge acting against the rotation of the body. This is one of the effects the moon has on the Earth, slowing our rotation to the current 24 hours. It was faster in the past. Of course, what happens in one direction happens in the other, Newton. So Earth creates a tidal bulge on the Moon. The Moon is a smaller body, so this bulge has a portion greater breaking effect. Added to this, the Moon was close to Earth in the past, and the distant past was a more molten body before it cooled, so the bulge would have had a significantly larger effect on the Moon's rotation. So it's become tidally locked, so we end up with just one face facing the Earth, though the, the Moon is still rotating. In terms of the Earth, I mean, if we went back 400 million years to Devonian period, then Earth actually had a, a day about 22 hours long, which meant a year of 400 days. Is that right? It is, it is, it is. And that's, that's the effect that the Earth and the Moon have had on each other. Well, thanks for that, Paul. And Twitter, where can we find you on Twitter, Paul? Um, at AstroDen, Astro underscore Den, D. And you've and got a website as well with lots more astronomy stuff on. Yeah, that's... What's that one? That's the Astronomer's Den. Um, we'll blog a few musings about astronomy. And the final thing to say is that if you come into Astro Camp in Wales this month, in fact, this weekend, we'll see you there. And if not, we'll be back next month. So until then, we're going to find out who'd win in a thumb wrestle. And it's goodbye 
from Cydonia Base. Goodbye. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins and Paul Hill and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion in our Facebook group, which you can find by typing Awesome Astronomy into the Facebook search bar. And you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us through our website, Facebook group, or Twitter. If you have any comments for the show, you can email them to us direct at inbox at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for downloading this podcast and for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Go on. Right, go on. Um, You've got to try and bend the thumb over, is that right? You want to, you, right, go on. Go. So it's going to go one, two, three, four. Do what? I declare a war, and then you, what? you go for it. Have you never, you've never had a thumb? No. Over? No, no. You, go, you, go like, you go over, go one, one two, two, three, four. four. I declare thumb some war. war. <laughs> God, you're strong. Oh, hold on, that's cheating. Look at that elbow. Surely you meant to keep your elbow down. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Is it? Oh, you've got strong thumbs. This is becoming a stalemate. Surely. It's not meant to be this much pain, surely. My thumb's locked. Do you have to... Can you not go for a... What are you doing? Oh, sorry. God, man alive. Oh. What do we do? There can be no winner here. What do we do? My thumb's going white. <laughs> I, I think we're going to have to call that one a draw. That's a draw. That's a draw. <laughs> that is a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>